Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome. And happy Father's Day, which we'll hear more about in a moment. Happy Father's Day. But welcome. Special welcome to any visitors who are with us this morning. Have we got visitors with us this morning? Yeah. Visiting from? Alaska. It's a long way to come to church. Delighted to have you here. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Any other visitors with us? Yes. From Pennsylvania. Right, that's quite close by comparison. That's, uh, well then, any other visitors with us? Yes, of course. Virginia. From Virginia. We'll be getting a mention just later on, Virginia. But uh, any others? Any others? Well, anyway, welcome. You'll see in our wor- order of worship that today we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, which all are invited to receive who wish to approach Christ's table in, in faith. Other notices for today, the flowers on the Whitfield pulpit today are in memory of Eric and Muriel Parker and donated by Jeff and and Elizabeth Parker. A a close of worship, there's um, coffee and tea served outside the the West Hall. We we cancelled the barbecue yesterday evening, the bomb barbecue, because of the weather forecast. It was, of course, a a beautiful evening. (laughs) It's now... Tonight at 6.30 and and the forecast is rain. Um, (laughs) See, if we lived in a country like Scotland, the weather's always predictable and you know know exactly what to plan. You know it's going to rain. So that's it. So at the moment, 6.30 at the manse. That's the plan. That's the plan, David. And then on Saturday morning um, at the Anglican Cathedral, you'll see there, again, for funds for bombs trip to Malawi, a uh, codfish breakfast, and that's been served from 8 o'clock to virtually lunchtime to 1 o'clock. So that's, uh, that's on Saturday. David, the roti sales, dates for these? Friday, roti sales. Friday, Friday lunchtime. Okay, perfect. Um, also available today is the memorial booklet for our 300th anniversary, and uh, Liz has got these. She's disappeared. Where is she? Anyway, Liz, Liz has got these. Will be available. These will be available afterwards. And I think these are all the all the notices, all things to be drawn attention to for this particular Sunday. So while there's been Father's Day, it's it's Trinity, Trinity Sunday, the Sunday after Pentecost. So let us worship God by singing to His praise. Him 111. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. Hymn 111.
It is good to give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. How can I repay the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the Lord by name. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily praise your holy name. O oh, gracious God, we gather this morning in response to your invitation to this your holy table, that thereby a divine mystery we may partake in the very life of Christ as he does in us. As we approach your table, we confess that we have not lived as we should. We have sinned in thought, word, and deed. And for this now, we ask forgiveness. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O oh, merciful God, grant us the assurance of your forgiveness. Pardon and deliver us from all our wrongdoings. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness. You have prepared for your people such good things as pass our human understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Right, the boys and girls like to come down to the front for just a, a short time. Okay. Right, lovely to see you all. Great to see you. Now, today I said it's a special day. What's today? Father's Day. Father's Day. Okay, what happens on Father's Day? Tell me. What do you do for Father's Day? Yes. You thank your dad for being your dad. For being, that's a lovely thing to say, yes. I give you give your dad presents. Dad, ooh, well done, dad. <laughs> Anything else for Father's Day? Yeah. You make food for them sometimes? Yeah, make breakfast. Anything else? Yeah. Make a card. Make a card, okay. You go for the, you, you do as you're told in the words. Yeah, that's a great answer as well. Yeah. You appreciate them, yes. You do favours for them, yeah? And you let them watch the golf, okay? If it's a <laughs> that's what you do this afternoon. What, why, why do we have a Father's Day? Why do you think we should try Father's Day? Yeah. That's the, that's the day you show your dad really love him. That's another thing. Any, any other reason why we have a Father's Day? Hmm? Any other reason for a Father's Day? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because we have a Mother's Day. <laughs> right. Actually, these are old, old festivals, right? They started out as church festivals, all right? And started Mother's, Mother's Day was Mothering Sunday. And it was the day everyone went back to the church they'd baptized in. Father's Day also goes a long way back. And that was a festival of the Saint Joseph. Who's Joseph might have been in the Bible, can we think? Who's, who might, who, yeah, who was his son? Well, he was Jesus' dad, right? So St. Joseph's Day was a day when they remembered, the church remembered Joseph and all he had done to help bring up Jesus. That's St. Joseph's Day. And that goes back in one of the churches 1,500 years and in another church it goes back about 500 years. But Father's Day came much, much later, right? And it wasn't a church day at all. It was just a day that, that, people, that people celebrated. And it really started because somebody said, well, we've got Mother's Day 
So we should have a Father's Day. It doesn't seem right to have a Mother's Day. We should have a Father's Day. And actually, one of the things that started it, I mentioned Virginia earlier, there was a terrible mining disaster in Virginia. Monaga, Monon, Monaga, I think it was. Anyway, there was over 400 miners killed. And about 300 of them were dads, were fathers, and 1,000 children were left without a dad. And one of the ladies who wanted to do something to remember fathers, so it started started Father's Day. And, but it was started for all sorts of reasons. People wanting to remember their father because of that mining disaster and because there was a Mother's Day. Are there any other days that we have? Because I didn't know this until I went and did some research on this. Did you know that? Did you know there's a Grandparents Day? Right? There's a Grandparents Day. And I think in the United States it's in August and in the United Kingdom it's in October, Grandparents Day. And it was started by age concern. There you go. <laughs> Grandparents. Grandparents Day. Did you know there's a Children's Day? Did you know that? Every day. No, did you know <laughs> Did you know there was a Children's Day? So, Mother's Day and Father's Day, mums get presents, dads get presents. Okay? Children's Day? All get, should you all get presents on Children's Day? Shouldn't you then? Yeah? Should you? Yeah, it was last Sunday. Too bad, eh? <laughs> it's the second Sunday in June. And there's a siblings day, right? A brothers and sisters day. There's a brothers and sisters. All these strange days that I must admit I didn't, I didn't really know about. And the thing that worried me about that is the ones that get missed out, right? What if you're not a brother or sister or you're, you know, you're grown up, but you're not a dad or you're, you're not a mom? You're the, what about all the ones that get missed out? And that made me think about what we do later in church today when we have what we call communion or the Lord's Supper because everyone is invited. Everyone is invited. These special days we have, Father's Day, Mother's Day, it was to say how, recognize how special they are. Well, when we come to this table, it's God recognizing how special we all are, right? He invites all. And I always think it's a strange thing that if you think you're having some sort of special meal, who would you invite? And the special meal that we remember today was Jesus' meal with his disciples, who he knew were going to let him down and, and run away, and one of them was even going to betray him, and yet he had that meal that he shared with them. And just as it was shared with them, it's shared with us. He, he knows that none of us are perfect, but we can come not because we're perfect, but because he invites us, because he thinks like you, we're all special. We're going to sing now for Father's Day, one that we haven't done before. It's also the day of, of called the, the Spirit. Remember the Spirit dancing in creation. So you don't know this one. So could you play it through first? Uh, um, play it through first, Oliver. Just play the chorus and the verse.
there's a hay at the end. You missed it, didn't you? You all missed the hay at the end? Right, so we're going to get it right this time. So just once through, Oliver. Back to the piano. Back to the piano. So, chorus, verse, final chorus, hey. We sing and shout it, God is good. We celebrate, God is good. for a blessing on the children, loving God. As our children go from here, may they go with your blessing, knowing at all times in their lives, your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear the word of God proclaimed in the Old Testament. First reading is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 8, from verse 1 to 4, and then verse 22 to 31. You'll find this on page 590 in the Old Testament section of the Bible. Chapter 8, verse 1. Does not wisdom call, and does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroad, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portal, she cries out, to you, O people, I call, and my cry is to all that live. Now verse 22. The Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago, I was set up, at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped. Before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields, or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle in the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. When he established the fountains of the deep when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside him like a master worker, and I was daily his delight, re rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the human race. Today's gospel is the gospel of St. John. St. John's gospel, chapter 16, and <coughs> at verse 12. St. John's gospel, chapter 16, verse 12, page 110 in your New Testament. It's part of the continuing farewell discourse with, of Jesus with his disciples. When Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, and because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, for this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you.
May God bless to us the reading of his word. And to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. Psalms and at Psalm number 8, which is hymn number 4. How excellent in all the earth, Lord our Lord, is thy name. Hymn number 4. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As I said at the beginning of our worship today, as well as being Father's Day, is also Trinity Sunday, the first Sunday after, after Pentecost, and when we enter into what is called proper time in the church seasons. Trinity Sunday to reflect on the doctrine of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As I said before, it's generally a Sunday that ministers take off, <laughs> hand over to a visiting preacher or indeed the worship group rather than get involved in the sort of complexities of the doctrine of the Trinity. The other approach is the one I'll take and that's simply just to ignore it altogether <laughs> and, and preach on something, something slightly different. Our Reading from the Old Testament, from the book of Proverbs, is actually chosen for today because it talks about the Spirit, the Spirit that was with God at the, at the beginning of creation, that danced joyfully uh, over creation, was, was there as a, to accompany God the Father in his, in his creative works. It's part of what we call the wisdom literature. It's interesting that, by and large, the literature which seems to be given most emphasis or most attention in the Old Testament is what's called all that deals with salvation history. In other words, salvation history of the Jewish people. Their early years, the origins of them as a people, their time of slavery in Egypt, and then their eventual escape from there and, and all, that, all that followed them through the succeeding centuries. It's sometimes simply described as a morality tale and the reason for that is, is, is quite simple, that having escaped from slavery in, in Egypt, and during their wanderings in the desert, under Moses, they enter into a covenant with God, that he will weather God and they will be his people, that he will look after them and care for them, but, but at the same time, they have to keep up their side of the, of the covenant and live in obedience to, to his ways. And I say morality tale because the tale that then follows is a sort of repeated cycle of his people not living up to the covenant into which they have entered, but going their own disobedient ways. Everything from worshipping other gods to failing to care for the most needy in their society, to look after the widows and the orphans, to become corrupt and, and greedy. And when such as that happened, then God's punishment befalls them. Either through the Assyrian Empire they get invaded or the Babylonian Empire. In other words, God uses other nations and empires round about to, to teach them a lesson. At the same time, he uses other empires like the Persian Empire under King Cyrus 
to bring an end to their suffering and after the Babylonian exile to enable them to re- return, return home. That's salvation history. It's a history of God constantly intervening in the lives of his people, either for good or for ill due to their, their punishments. But alongside that in the Old Testament, we find the wisdom literature. And it has quite a different, quite a different feel to it. And this instead is kind of reflecting, reflecting on the nature of, of creation. It's acknowledging God as, as, as creator of all, a reasonable God who would create something that in itself was reasonable and was rational. And so by examining it, by delving into nature and its secrets, by understanding it better, we understand at the same time something of the very nature of God. I think there's a sense in which the wisdom literature speaks more to our time and societies today than does perhaps the salvation history. The, the idea of God intervening in a very direct way through punishment and reward, through the using of empires to, to either punish or, or reward his people. Instead, people are perhaps more into understanding better the very essence of creation. How does it work? What lies at its heart? Is it its simplicity or complexity? Its unity or harmony? And the wisdom literature reflects on that. And it really reflects on the idea that, that nature is is harmonized, it's unified, and by looking at it, we learn something of, of God's being. It's a very positive view. As the wisdom literature develops, and it includes books like the books of Job, then there's a realization and an acknowledgement that in creation, there is not only unity and harmony, but there's disorder and chaos. Not only is there good, but there also would seem to be evil, and the writers of the wisdom literature are trying to come to terms with that, to reconcile that, to to understand what that means about the nature of God, transcendent because his place is in the heavens and yet imminent because he is to be found in life and and in creation. It's the wisdom literature and the place of the spirit within that. The spirit that Jesus refers to and these rather strange words to the disciples in his farewell discourse. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. He's actually said so much to them in the farewell discourse that they must wonder what more is there to come. But he comes out with a strange sentence. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Was it more? Was it additionally to everything he had said? Philip, remember, had asked him, show us the Father, and then we'll be satisfied. And he says to Philip, Philip, have you been with me all this time? And you haven't yet realized that in seeing me and in being with me, you you see the Father. I am in the Father and the the Father in me. The works I do are the works of the Father. What more is there to be added to that? I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. I sometimes think in just reading these verses of Scripture, maybe we don't stop for a moment and, and reflect on what were the emotions and the feelings that were around at that time? Jesus in his, what's described as his farewell discourse to the disciples. They'd been together for maybe 18 months or three years. He knows that what awaits them in Jerusalem is arrest and execution. He talks about his resurrection. But for the disciples, is there a sadness in this? What's, what's the emotions that are that are going around, what, what can he say to them? Or what would he want to say to them at that time but causes him to say, you cannot bear them now? Is it because they cannot come to terms with what it is that's going to, to happen to him? I remember years ago, a close friend at college lost his father at a relatively young age, his teenage years. His father was a doctor, he was a GP. And I remember him telling me that he he sat the family down, sat the kids down to to, to tell them what was to happen because he had a terminal terminal illness. And he wanted to just kind of share this with them and and prepare them and and let them know what what lay ahead. And didn't get very far. Didn't get very far, just found the task really impossible beyond him and and beyond them. And so they just just broke it off and, and let nature take its course. Maybe it was too difficult for him to say and for them to bear at that time. And that's maybe partly what what this verse is about as well. 
But then he goes on to say, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And that demonstrates the oneness of, of Father, Son, and, and Holy Spirit. What Jesus the Son does is simply the acts of God, the, the acts of the Father. And this, anything the Spirit will lead us into is no more and no less than what Jesus himself would have done. He knows he's going to depart from his disciples, but they have the hope, the promise, that that spirit will lead them in the future. The church struggled with that in the early years. John, in one of his letters, talks about false spirits of people claiming to be proclaiming in the name of the Holy Spirit and taking the church in completely the wrong direction. And constantly, they have to go back to the words and the teachings of, of, of Jesus himself to see if what they're hearing is in conflict with them or not. But then he talks about new things as well, things yet to come. And that's a struggle for the church. Things that Jesus didn't deal with in his day because they are of our day. And, and the task of trying to discern how the Spirit leads us in these questions and examinations of what is right and what is wrong and, and the many social issues that we face and trying always to reconcile it, what would have been, what was the teaching the teaching of Christ. As I say, the, the Old Testament lesson, the Proverbs talk about, talk about God's presence, his, his imminence, his presence in life and in creation as, as well as his transcendence, his dwelling place in eternity. What about in this meal that we share today, the sacrament of Holy Communion, which, which talks about, about his presence? Where do we... Where in the sharing of this meal, where do we find, where do we find that presence? I mentioned before that an occasion back in my previous congregation in Melrose, I'd do a swap with my Episcopal colleague. He would take a service for me in the little country church of Bowden, and as compensation, I would celebrate for him his eight o'clock Eucharist. Um, very Anglican to have communion at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, we have it as well, 8 o'clock in the morning, but never mind, it's another matter. But 8 o'clock was the, was the Eucharist. It wasn't a big congregation ever, but one particular January I turned up and there was no congregation. Right, there was no congregation. It was a pretty snowy day. It wasn't a very great day. So there I am in the church alone thinking to myself, so what do I do? Do I, do I celebrate communion or, or do I just go home and have some breakfast? In, in some traditions, the priests, particularly the Roman Catholic tradition, but probably also in the Orthodox, would, would just go ahead and celebrate, even though there's, there's no one, even though there's no one there. What do you think? I went home and had breakfast. <laughs> it, it, it didn't seem to me that the, the presence of Christ, if you like, was, was there in me simply reciting the words and, and doing the actions. And then strangely on the news this morning in the, the BBC News, I read just a short story about a farmer in Wales who is keeping the church on his land open. Uh, he's now the only member. It's a little Baptist chapel in, in Wales on his farmland, which apparently meant a huge amount to his mother, now deceased. So in really in, in her name, he keeps the chapel open. And he has a service there once a month. And he invites in a visiting preacher. And he invites in a few friends and neighbors. And I think out of solidarity with them, they, they, they come along. And he accepts that one day it, it will close. When he's gone, it will close. They have the service. He can't play the organ. Some of the windows are broken and there's a lot of cobwebs. But he's determined to keep it open. It's not, I'm just not sure about that either. Christ's presence, God's presence isn't just about a particular a particular building. So where is it in this sharing of, of Holy Communion? Is it not in the community that is gathered round the table that we find that we find his presence? As we come to the table, as we serve one another. And it's, and it's an important it's an important part of the Reformed tradition, our own tradition, that I think we often miss, that as the elements, the bread and the wine, are taken out to you. You are serving one another. 
And that's the, that is the nature of it. It's not all coming forward to be served by the priests, but all of you serving, serving one another, a sense of community and a sense of acceptance of one another in doing that. As I said to the children, it's a remarkable fact that that Last Supper, Jesus shared with his disciples, men whom he knew were going to abandon him, were going to betray him, and yet they were all, all invited to share that supper with him. And so to us, not perfect, far from perfect, with our faults and our failings, but all accepted to this table, invited and accepted as we are. It's a lesson to us to be accepting of one another and accepting of those beyond the walls of this sanctuary. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our offering. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate this, our offering, and all our offerings of time, money, and talents, praying that they may be symbols of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the signs and the growth of your kingdom. In our prayers this day, we remember the needs of others, those who do not feel accepted for whatever reason, those who feel lonely and isolated, though surrounded by others. May they know the warmth and the strength of human friendship. We pray for those whom we know to be ill at this time, whether at home or in hospital, those recovering, and sadly those whom we know for whom there is no cure. May they and their families know the blessing of your peace. We pray for any who are lonely, troubled or anxious, for those struggling with broken relationships, and all who have been bereaved and who live still with that sense of loss and of absence. May they too be touched by the healing power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray for those whose lives are so very different from our own. In this world of great beauty, we reflect with sadness on the scar of violence, of war and civil war, and the suffering caused by it. We pray for a spirit of reconciliation, an overcoming of the barriers that divide, whether barriers of race or culture, the legacies of history, or political and economic barriers. But there are too in our world those who struggle with poverty and hunger this day, and millions who live as refugees. May we commit ourselves to a more just society and a more just world. We pray to you for your church, your church in heaven and on earth, your church gathered round this table, the very body of Christ in the world today, Christ's eyes and ears and lips 
and caring hands. We pray that we may live up to our calling to discipleship. And we remember always those no longer with us, but whose love we were privileged to know. May we never think them far from us. For as we share communion with you, we share too communion and fellowship with them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Draw near to the holy table and hear the gracious words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. The communion hymns are 76 and 19. These are psalms of ascent. These are psalms that pilgrims would sing as they approached uphill to Jerusalem and to the temple of their day. So first 76, how can I ever thank the Lord for all his gifts to me? And then hymn number 19, ye gates lift up your heads on high.
Blessed are you, Lord God of the universe. You are the giver of this bread. Fruit of the earth and of human labor, let it become the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of the universe. You are the giver of this wine. Fruit of the vine and of human labor, let it become the wine of the eternal kingdom. As the grain once scattered in the fields and the grapes once dispersed on the hillside are now reunited on this table in bread and wine, so, Lord, may your whole church soon be gathered together from the corners of the earth into your kingdom. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Therefore, with your people of all places and times, and with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your greatness and sing your praises in the angel's song. Almighty God, all power is yours. You created the heavens and established the earth. You sustain in being all that is. In Christ, your Son, our life and yours are brought together. He made his home among us that we might forever dwell in you. Through your Holy Spirit, you call us to new birth and a creation restored by love. May this life-giving Spirit who spoke through Moses and the prophets, who descended upon Jesus in the River Jordan and upon the apostles on the day of Pentecost, transfigure this Thanksgiving meal, that this bread and wine may become for us the body and blood of Christ, and we may be kindled with the fire of your love and renewed for the service of your kingdom. May this creative spirit accomplish the words of your beloved Son, who on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. United by one baptism in the same Holy Spirit and the same body of Christ, we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. 
Jesus told his apostles, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. The bread which we break is the communion in the body of Christ. The cup of blessing for which we give thanks is the communion in the blood of Christ. Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world. Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world. Take, eat, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Do this in remembrance of him. This cup is a new covenant in the blood of Christ. Drink from it, all of you, in remembrance of him. gifts of God to his people.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thanks for this sacrament in bread and wine, symbols of a life shared, a life given, a life sacrificed. We reflect again on the invitation to this, your holy table. As the disciples were invited to share in that last supper, so too are we with our faults and failings invited to this table, accepted and loved by you. And so may we go from here this day and be accepting and loving of those whom we meet. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hymn 182. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices. Now go in peace, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and always.